Margaret Rodenberg, author of the historical novel Finding Napoleon. It's based in part on a real, unfinished novel that Napoleon Bonaparte tried to write. In Finding Napoleon, the defeated emperor finishes writing his idealistic, romantic novel, but from his point of view as Europe's most powerful man after he's lost everything. His last lover, audacious Albine de Montalon, helps narrate their own tale of intrigue, love, and betrayal. To succeed with his plans, Napoleon must learn whom to trust. To survive, Albine must decide whom to betray. I'd like to tell you why I wrote Finding Napoleon and why you might like to read it. For me, the story behind this novel starts when, as a young teen, I moved to France with my U.S. Navy family. There I heard how Napoleon had escaped his exile on the Mediterranean island of Elba, landed on the French coast with 800 soldiers, marched 500 miles to Paris, and reinstated himself as emperor, all without firing a shot. That heroic story stuck with me, far more than the fact that 100 days later, Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo led to his second exile on desolate, remote St. Helena Island in the South Atlantic. But let's jump forward in my life, through a business career and well into my second marriage, to the moment I came across a mention that Napoleon, when he was 26 years old, had tried to write a romantic novel of love and betrayal. To my delight, the scribbled manuscript still existed. Right then and there, I vowed to finish it for him. Napoleon called his work Clisson et Eugenie, though he later shortened the title to the hero's name, Clisson. I envisioned my Clisson as a complete novel by Napoleon Bonaparte and Margaret Rodenberg. But to ghostwrite for Napoleon, I had to understand him as a person. Oh, not which battles he'd won and lost, not why he invaded Egypt, or worse, Russia, or how he entered into the Louisiana Purchase after his infamous failure in Haiti, but what he thought and felt about himself when he was a young man who hadn't even met his true love, Josephine. The truth is that for most of us, he's a stick figure, a short guy in a funny hat with his hands stuck in his vest. In fact, a third of even that isn't true. He was five foot six, average height for a Frenchman of his time. So you get the challenge in trying to write about Napoleon. Early in my research, I realized the aging emperor himself should finish his youthful manuscript as he looked back on the potential he'd once had, and as he came to grips with what he'd become. For inspiration and to bring you, the reader, a truly authentic experience, I, like Napoleon, traveled thousands of miles to St. Helena Island. It's still British territory, but the French own and maintain its Napoleonic sites, including Longwood House, Napoleon's principal residence on the little island. It was there, standing alone in the haunting rooms of the musty ramshackle home where Napoleon lived and died, the stick figure became, for me, a flesh and blood human being. One who is Shakespearean in his genius and in his fatal flaws. So what does that make the novel, Finding Napoleon? Foremost, I hope it is, as courting Mr. Lincoln author, Louis Bayard kindly said, a rousing, delightfully peopled adventure with exquisite scene setting and crackling storytelling. He's one of my favorite authors, so you can see that I'm really proud of that quote. Partly, my novel is the defeated Napoleon's personal battle against his British jailers and how Napoleon changed due to the loyalty and betrayal on St. Helena Island. His last lover, Albine, plays an equal role, a forgotten woman of history she lacks Napoleon's genius, but as a charming rogue, she rivals him in ambition. When their interests diverge, sparks fly. Meanwhile, intertwined in the St. Helena story 
the aging emperor completes his youthful novel, Clisson. Now it's not simply a soldier's love story. It's Napoleon's mythic origin story, told as a father's message to the young son from whom he's been separated. Peopling these stories are the delightful characters Lou Bayard mentions. Among them, there's Toby, an enslaved man who conspires with Napoleon. There's Cipriani, Napoleon's mysterious Corsican henchman. Solomon, a merchant who smuggles Napoleon's messages between continents. There's Albine's husband, Charles, torn between greed and loyalty. And Betsy, a 14-year-old girl whose laughter lightens the emperor's dark days. Within this milieu, what Kirkus Reviews called an intricate tapestry, everyone's motives are suspect. Napoleon, when asked by one of his St. Helena entourage how they could possibly fill the time in exile, said, why, we shall write our memoirs. His intent as a world-class propagandist was to cement his reputation. My novel, Finding Napoleon, is meant as entertainment, a memorable voyage to a satisfying conclusion with fascinating characters in a remote time and place. Its message, if you think a novel requires one, is found in an excerpt from the poem by Yevgeny Yevtushenko that I quoted at the front of Finding Napoleon. Power is a small blessing, bad for the nerves. We should be creating masterpieces, masterpieces. I hope you'll take a moment to look at Finding Napoleon, and if you do, that you'll join Napoleon, Albine, the novel's cast of engaging characters, and me in asking, what does it mean to create a masterpiece of your life?